So tonight we're going to sort of focus on something called SIBO, um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But because we're talking about this, it's going to have a lot to do with the gut and a lot of other things that we see that can sometimes be missed in the big Lyme puzzle. So this is actually one of my favorite things to talk about when we talk about Lyme because I think a lot of times uh, we don't necessarily go into a lot of the other things that we see and really making sure we're treating the whole person and the gut is a huge picture of that. So we will tell you sort of how we diagnose it, how we treat it and why it's so important uh, as we deal with any kind of chronic concern, but especially when it comes to the biotoxins and other things that we see with Lyme. Just sort of to get an idea, how many people have heard of SIBO or know what it is? Okay. Well, that actually is really good because I know even a couple years ago when I would mention SIBO in any kind of context or in front of any kind of population, a lot of people didn't know what it was. And so, and any time I'm lecturing or talking to Lyme patients, you guys are always a little bit smarter than the average person. So <laughs> it makes sense that you guys would have heard of it and know a little bit about it. So um, this is just a little bit more about me, uh, but Gail already went over this. So uh, I guess the important part of this is just that I've uh, gone to a lot of school, um, treated a lot of different things, and now work at a clinic both in Egan and then work with natural medicine of Stillwater, uh, treating various uh, conditions and concerns, and definitely one of the people and groups that we see a lot of is Lyme. And so really working to make sure that we are treating the whole picture of Lyme and chronic diseases. So one of the things that I think is important and one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about SIBO when it came to Lyme is for two main reasons. Uh, I think in general when we talk about the approach to any kind of chronic infection, a lot of times unfortunately we miss the boat um, as practitioners. You know, I think that the way that we're trained and the way that we look at it both in an alternative and traditional medicine model is that we think of an infection in the sense of an acute infection. So we're used to being good diagnostic practitioners when it comes to someone coming in and having like an acute sinusitis. So when someone comes in and they you know, have an infection and they haven't felt good for two days, it's very easy for us to say, oh, that's a sinusitis, let's give you an antibiotic and you're you know, feeling better two days later. We're good at diagnosing that, we're good at treating that, and we're good at it being a nice little closed book when it's done. The problem is that when we talk about a chronic infection, and especially when we talk about Lyme, that it's not just the infection part of it, but it's all the damage that the biotoxins have done, that the bacteria have done, that the immune system has done from fighting this off for so long. And what we find a lot of times is that because of that, there's a lot of other things that have to be treated. Uh, there's a lot of components that go into treating somebody with Lyme, and the gut is a huge component of that. And so, you know, we often refer to Lyme disease as, you know, what we call the great imitator. And what we mean by that is that there's a lot of signs and symptoms that go into Lyme disease. And you can see from this slide that we sort of listed them. And that's where it can be really hard, as all of you guys no, it can be really hard because you sort of go from one doctor to another, you go looking from one answer to another, and you don't always get, uh, you know, everybody's journey is a little bit different, and you don't always get the answers uh, of why, you know, this is happening or that's happening. So with Lyme disease, you know, you can see everything from, you know, upper respiratory to muscle pain, joint pain. Uh, you can obviously see it's from the bacterial and viral infection things happening from there, gut uh, concerns can come up, uh, TMJ, things like that. You know, we just see a lot of things with Lyme disease. As you're going to see in the next slides, we also see a lot of those things with SIBO. So what we're finding and why we're so passionate about testing people for SIBO, especially Lyme patients, uh, teaching people about SIBO is that a lot of times we find that this goes undiagnosed and untreated and that we can't really get ahead of the infectious disease with Lyme until we also go after uh, SIBO and digestive health. So you can see that this is, comes straight from the website from stillwaternatural.com um, and uh, I know that it's sort of small uh, but if you can sort of see, uh, you know, this is a blog post that Dr. Bush wrote, you know, do I have Lyme disease or SIBO? And 
one of the things that we find is we definitely have people who come in, especially in this part of the world, and they say, I know I have Lyme because I have muscle pain, uh, I'm not feeling good, uh, and I can't shake it. And we find that they have SIBO. Uh, but we also see a lot of Lyme patients who you know, have gone through extensive treatments, obviously have gotten a lot of antibiotic treatments or natural treatments, uh, gone down that path, and then they come to us and we actually find little evidence of Lyme, but what we do find now is that they haven't approached or addressed some of these other infections that have also been there. And one of the analogies that I always use is when it comes to infections and it comes to diseases, a lot of times nothing parties alone. So a lot of times there's co-infections uh, and co-concerns that we also have to address, SIBO being a main one that a lot of times goes undiagnosed and treated. But so you can see from this blog post that if any of you guys want to look at it uh, closer, you can go to stillwaternatural.com. But you can see the signs and symptoms that go along with SIBO and that a lot of times they overlap um, with what we see uh, with Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella. So when we talk about muscle pain, joint pain, headaches, anxiety and depression, insomnia, constipation, belching, candida, intestinal pain, bloating, skin rashes, gas, heartburn, nausea, and gallstones. Those are all things that obviously we see with Lyme um, and some of the other co-infections, and then we see them with SIBO too. So that's why it's important for us to sort of address uh, SIBO with our Lyme patients. And then as you can see, SIBO also is a great imitator. So it looks a lot like other diseases. That's why a lot of times it goes undiagnosed or untreated. Uh, a lot of times we'll see people come in who do obviously have Lyme, but that they also have SIBO. So we can't really get the immune system up and running and get them better until we also address SIBO. And the other interesting thing is that when we look at this, SIBO treatments do really overlap with Lyme treatments. And so uh, with SIBO, it, we also use antibiotics. We use a very specific one called Rifaximin or Zyfaxin. Uh, we also can use herbs, and at Stillwater uh, and the other clinic I work at called Synapse, we do use both. So we put people, depending on what we find, uh, and we'll go into how we uh, diagnose SIBO, but depending on what we find, we use both herbs and antibiotics. So what exactly is SIBO? Uh, SIBO is an excessive amount of bacteria in the small intestine. And so what it means is that when we look at digestion in general, the way that our digestion should be is that we have our stomach, so that's sort of that first main stop in digestion, and then we have our small intestine, which is responsible for absorbing our nutrients, so it's responsible for really providing uh, the nutrients to our body, and then the large intestine, which is mainly responsible for elimination. We should have a larger amount of bacteria in our stomach so that if we do um, you know, get exposed to some bacteria, we know how to take care of it through stomach acid and uh, probiotics that are in our stomach. And then we should have larger amounts of bacteria in our large intestine, and that's where a lot of our probiotics, the good bacteria, live. What can happen is we can start to see an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. And so this then interferes with absorption, it interferes with uh, at really every part of life because of the fact that you're no longer going to be utilizing and absorbing your nutrients the way that you should. And so what we have to do then is first diagnose it, and then what we have to do is really get the gut rebalanced. So get the bacteria so that it's not living in the small intestine, and then get it colonized back into the stomach and into the large intestine. A big picture of this too, obviously, also is the microbiome. So the good bacteria in our body, it's really about replenishing that environment the way that it should be and getting that microbiome the way um, that it really should be so that we have optimal health. And I think that a lot of you know, the research now and what we're really realizing is that the microbiome is huge when it comes to health and wellness, that there's not enough emphasis that we can put on the good bacteria. And so obviously when you're fighting any kind of infection, especially a chronic infection like Lyme, there has to be a hit to that microbiome because you have to get rid of the bad bacteria. 
But in order to build your body back up and to get your immune system back to where it needs to be, your brain health back to where it needs to be, your gut health back to where it needs to be, we need to focus on rebalancing the gut. And you know, one of the first questions we have to answer when we're going after this rebalancing of the gut is, is there an infection there that we have to remove before we re-inoculate? And that's such an important question because it changes the game. So if we just know that you've been depleted because of treatments, herbal treatments or antibiotics, then we know we have to replenish and we have to go for a number of bacteria and strains. Strains are really important because a lot of times, you know, I can't tell you how many people I've uh, had come in to see me who, you know, say I've been taking a probiotic for 10 years and they've taken the same one. So one of the things that I love to you know, really teach my patients and one thing that I think everyone can do that makes a big difference is switch up your probiotics because you don't just want the number of probiotics, you want the different strains. And so this is extremely important with Lyme patients or any other chronic infection because what happens is that you know, you're given usually a large amount of broad spectrum antibiotics or herbals that are going to deplete that microbiome just by the nature of the game. And so that's where it's really important to make sure then that we're rebuilding these friendly bacteria and rebalancing, like I said, really the whole body um, with the bacteria the way uh, that it should be. To give you guys an idea too about the importance of the microbiome, I think it's interesting when you look at the story of the fact that you know in the early 2000s, we sort of solved the mystery of the genome all the human genes and you know it was sort of a breakthrough for us to be able to say okay now we can take any person and we can see what your genes say we can see if you have mutations we can see what how your genes are different from your brothers or different from you know your spouses and we thought this was going to be a home run so we thought we'd solved everything with the human genome project almost immediately they started the human microbiome project and really realize that we are more of the bacteria that make, it, make us up than even the genes. And so that's where I think you'll see more and more about the microbiome. And to give you an idea, you know, we have a trillion cells, but we have 10 trillion bacteria with us. So it's really important for us to focus on this part of health and uh, wellness and then rebalancing the body too, especially when it comes to the gut uh, and any infection that might be there. So when there is an infection in the gut, uh, in the small intestine, um, what happens then is that it's either coming really from two different sources. It can either come because you have low stomach acid and so the bacteria from the stomach are able to survive and get into the small intestine or because they're able to migrate up from the large intestine. So what happens then is that we can start to diagnose this by doing a breath test. So the only way we can really tell if there is an overgrowth is to do a breath test. And we test two different gases, hydrogen and methane, and see if there is an overgrowth. And if there is, then we can treat you according to what kind of species would produce hydrogen versus what species would produce methane. Uh, and then after we treat the infection, then we can go to rebalancing the gut and getting gut uh, health back. Does that all make sense? Okay. So some of the things that you might see where if you're starting to see these symptoms, it might be a good idea for us to check into some other things to see if there are other things going on than just Lyme or post-Lyme um, concerns. So with SIBO, we see a lot of nausea, a lot of indigestion problems, a lot of gas both ways, um, burping, belching, um, and also passing gas. Bloating is a huge one. We see a lot of bloating um, and problems digesting certain foods like protein. Uh, you can also either have diarrhea or constipation, and a lot of times this will switch back and forth. A lot of IBS is actually SIBO, undiagnosed. That's why you'll now see that commercial with the little small intestine walking around. And that drug he's uh, trying to get you to take is rifaximin, the antibiotic for SIBO. So the doctors are starting to figure out a lot of IBS is SIBO, but because they don't want to necessarily go into all this teaching, they're just trying to get people on the drug. So it's sort of interesting to know that we're you know, making these connections, um, but still trying to catch up to passing this information on to people. 
Um, bad breath, so people that have, and this is something I hear a lot from my SIBO patients once we start treating it, they'll say, you know, all of a sudden my husband <laughs> realizes that I don't have chronically bad breath, that it was the infection coming up through breath. So, um, you know, I get that a lot from patients that they'll notice, uh, or their spouse will notice that their breath gets better. Uh, and then malnutrition, which can affect you on every level. And I think this is why it's really important with Lyme too, is that it's hard to rebuild your body, it's hard to rebuild your immune system, hard to obviously rebuild and repair those bacteria if you can't absorb your nutrients correctly. And if there's an infection in your small intestine, what happens then is that that affects absorption on all different levels. So these are the people that feel like, you know, they're turning their wheels in mud. Um, these are people that feel uh, you know, maybe that they've made some ground up with chronic infections in Lyme, but that they just can't get better. Uh, or they feel that their gut has been really affected uh, and that they're not able to repair that. It's because there's usually an infection there that if we go after that, repair the gut, re-inoculate, uh, then that can really do wonders for the whole body. Uh, we also, a lot of times, will see muscle weakness, joint pain, brain fog, anxiety, insomnia, headaches, GERD, um, neuropathy, and skin rashes. So you can see why this goes undiagnosed a lot with Lyme, is because of the fact that there are a lot of um, connections and a lot of parallels when it comes to symptoms. Uh, the brain-gut connection, so I think that this is obviously really, really important. And we, too, so in my chiropractic practice, I actually do a lot of the neurology part of it, uh, and I'm really fascinating, fascinated with how much sometimes we don't give attention to the brain. But one of the things that I think is just mind-boggling is how much we've realized that this brain-gut connection comes into play. And so it's a, really a two-way highway. The brain is constantly giving information to the gut, and then the gut is constantly giving information to the brain. Uh, when we're um, just being conceived and uh, being developed in embryology, uh, our gut and brain come from the same tissue. So that's why they're so connected. Uh, the other uh, sort of cool information to let you know exactly how connected they are is that we now know if anybody has a brain injury, a concussion or a traumatic brain injury, uh, within two hours their uh, guts become inflamed. Even if you haven't touched your gut in the trauma, but that shows you how powerful that two-way highway is. That if anything happens to the brain, the gut immediately also becomes inflamed and vice versa. If the gut is inflamed, your brain's gonna be inflamed. So that's why it's really important for us to address the brain-gut connection and get the gut back to where it needs to be, not only for the gut, but the brain. And as some of you probably know too, we now even refer to the gut as the second brain. So it's such an important part of you know, what we're doing. Uh, and really getting somebody back to optimal health. So uh, one of the things that we see with SIBO is that it's a common uh, cause of neurotransmitter imbalance. So people who just feel blue all the time or depressed or have anxiety that they can't really explain, you know, they could be sitting in the happiest environment and all of a sudden they feel anxious or have a panic attack. A lot of times that's because the inflammation is coming from below, it's coming from the gut. Um, and it sets off these neurotransmitters. When we talk about the gut being the second brain, 95% of our serotonin, that feel-good hormone that makes us happy, 95% of it's in our gut. So we think of it as obviously a brain chemical, because it is, but the majority of it is in the gut. So when we talk about you know, gut feelings and gut instincts, it's because we release those neurotransmitters uh, more in our gut a lot of times than we do even in our brain. So, uh, there's a lot of connection when it comes to brain and gut, and that's why it's so important for us to really address the gut. Um, bacterial activity stimulates immune response, which generates inflammation. So one of the important things, too, is that when we really look at keeping inflammation down in our gut, the number one thing that does that for us are the probiotics. And so we know that they help to keep inflammation where it needs to be, or cause, they also have the ability to cause inflammation to heal. So remember, not all inflammation is bad. You know, we obviously want inflammation at some level. We just don't want it under, or we just don't want it out of control. Uh, but the bacteria are really what's responsible for being able to dance that delicate dance. And then 
um, that inflammation stimulates the sympathetic response and reduces serotonin synthesis. So if our gut uh, this is sort of what I was talking about with the serotonin. If our gut is inflamed, then we're not going to produce enough serotonin and it's going to drastically decrease it. So when we're inflamed and when, I just call it angry, when we're angry, we're not going to go do the work to produce that feel-good hormone or even worry about you feeling good. You're just going to try to survive, not thrive. So our goal is to get the gut back, figure out what's going on, and to get it to heal so you can get back into thriving and not just surviving. Um, and then SIBO metabolic waste does affect nerve functioning on top of that. So you can see how this is a huge um, sort of tornado of things that occur when that brain or when that gut is off. And that's why it's so important for us to address it. But when we start to produce some of these byproducts from this infection, those things uh, and those byproducts very easily interfere with our neurotransmitters, especially one of them called acetylcholine which tells our nerves what to do. So for me to tell my arm to move from my brain, I've got to release acetylcholine at every nerve junction. And those byproducts start to interfere. And what I always tell my patients is create white noise. So all of a sudden then there's a lot of white noise so you can't do what you want with your neurotransmitters and your neurotransmitters just sort of give up. Um, so the key then is not for us to just give you tons of neurotransmitters, but to fix the problem so everything can communicate the way it should. And that all starts with the gut. So this slide just sort of tells you how prevalent SIBO is and how we think it's really an undiagnosed concern when it comes down to a, a plethora of conditions. So they're starting to see from more people doing SIBO tests and more practitioners really getting involved that really, uh, no matter what your practice is or your specialty, SIBO plays a big role. And so you can start to see some of the prevalence that chronic fatigue syndrome, they're finding that 81% of those uh, individuals have SIBO. Now, one of the things that I think is important and hopefully you'll take away